by donating or becoming a member. And now, please join me in welcoming Gary Fagan, the co-founder and artistic director of the Gage Academy of Art, who will introduce tonight's speakers. Thank you. Everybody. And uh, I'm so happy uh, to be here, and I'm so grateful uh, to Mike's family for agreeing to do this event. Uh, I would run into Mike and Elizabeth at openings, and uh, I have a program where I interview prominent local artists. I'll explain why in a minute. And I, Mike, obviously meaning that category, I go up and say, Mike, you got to do one of these programs with me at Town Hall. And he just goes sort of harumph. He said, oh, nobody wants to hear me pontificate about my work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I, I now know, and having talked about this, you know, with, with, uh, with Spike in recent times, he really, really, really wanted his work to speak for itself. So, uh, but so, I, I, uh, after he died, um, I did still have a bee in my bonnet about wanting to look at his amazing paintings, his provocative subject matter, his spectacular technique, and talk about the art. And so I approached Spike and he said, great. Um, and so tonight is the result. Now Gage Academy, you know, an art school partnering with Town Hall has been, you know, has been a wonderful opportunity. And why we do it is very simple. You know, we see our, our, our main role is training the artists of tomorrow. But on the other hand, if you, if, if you graduate them into a community where art isn't celebrated, talked about, uh, and, you know, frankly, collected, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, there is that. Um, you know, we're, it's, it's, we're only doing part of our job. So uh, one of the ways that we attempt to add to the vibrancy of the local art scene is by doing this series of conversations at Town Hall. And uh, we do about four a year, and so you can look at our website, gageacademy.org, or the Town, well, Town Hall website to see what's coming up in the 22-23 season. So at any rate, I'm delighted to be here for this conversation. Um, uh, Spike and Elizabeth asked me to be very brief in their introductions so we could get right on to the art. So um, as you know, or, 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 or probably know, I know there's lots of friends and family here. Uh, there was what I've been sort of uh, uh, jokingly calling an urban art colony in Montlake, where several generations of Spaffords lived and made art under the same roof. And uh, Elizabeth, the painter, uh, Spike, the photographer. And in fact, uh, uh, I will let you know that Spike uh, was a little late to dinner tonight because he was hanging a show which is opening tomorrow at um, <laughs> uh, at uh, Zocalo Studio. Is that do I have the name right? In Pioneer Square, you can look it up. And uh, just one other thing is that we're going to be looking at images. We're also going to be looking at uh, videos. Lisa, who's not on stage with us tonight but is Spike's wife as a filmmaker. And so she produced three short videos which we've interspersed with the images of, uh, of Mike's work. And so we'll be, we'll be looking at those as we proceed. Okay, so let's, let's get on to it. And uh, we'll start with this short video clip. You know, oftentimes people discuss the difference between science and, or technology and art and culture and stuff like that and say well they're very different they're the both they're, one's on the left side of the brain one's on the right side of the brain and, and things like that but i i found that at least the process that i use in painting allows me to work in a scientific method is this the best it can be? And I can usually say no. And then I'll work again and again and again until it's the least unlike the way I want it to be. Mm -hmm. 
Paul Clay was a, a very big influence on me. He wrote about the image being made up of things like lines and shapes and colors. It didn't have so much to do with what the image looked like, it was what the painting looked like that became important. And that has a lot to do with the physicality of the application of paint or taking it off or making some things smooth and some things not smooth so that they have some kind of conversation. You make a stroke and if it doesn't look any good, you make another stroke. You just keep doing it and doing it and doing it a thousand times until you get it good. I wanted to assault you somehow rather than just be background. Okay. Love that Descartes sweatshirt and uh, uh, God, is that Cogito Ergo Sum? Is that what that is? So we're going to see that makes several appearances. Uh, pingo, Pingo Ergo Sum. Yeah, it's going to make several appearances in this, uh, in, in our slideshow. So um, this is our earliest piece and, and the slideshow is more or less chronological. So Bruce in his uh, a wonderful catalog essay and the catalog is available at the table um, around the corner after our talk. Uh, talks about this one being uh, autobiographical. Uh, do, do you agree with that, Elizabeth, or in terms of, you know, an uh, incident that happened while he was an undergraduate? He painted this in Mexico, um, and I, I wouldn't say it's autobiographical. Um, my mother bought this painting because it, it, she became extremely attached to it, and I think she felt that it was kind of the universal effect of, of a, a hard world on anybody, on everybody. So the man in the box is um, it, it's painted in the colors of the 60s. You know, this was painted in Mexico probably 19... Um, 61, 60, 61, and we were living there. We had uh, left graduate school. We, uh, he had a studio across the street from the apartment that we lived in that a woman lent him that had no electricity, so he just painted in one room after another. He went from room to room, and this was, um, he did a series of these paintings that, um, had these slabs in them. Okay. So now, um, I apologize in advance. Uh, we will not talk about all the slides, just for lack right. of time. Uh, this next one is a photograph uh, in uh, Rome, uh, pre de Rome. Did he yes. get a fellowship to go to we, Rome? We, he, we came to the university in 1963. And he taught here for two or three years, and he, he had applied for this fellowship before from Mexico, but this is the first time he didn't get it, and I don't know if the second time he got it, but anyway, he won his fellowship. The university was not going to let him go because he hadn't been here very long, but Saul Katz stepped in and said, of course he has to go. So he, we went, we stayed two years, this is in his studio, and he started painting, um, is that a Labors of Hercules? The man lifting the man off the ground. Okay, yes. yeah. Hercules Sentes. Um, and uh, Spike, uh, you're there in single digits, is that right? That's correct. Yes. But no, two, you don't remember any of it. Um, there's a lot of photographs that uh, <laughs> are, are, are my memories of Rome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you know, now we get on to the mythology, which of course, and it, it's not even the totality of the subjects of the slides we're gonna be looking at, the art we're gonna be looking at tonight, but it was certainly, um, I would say, the dominant theme, and he kept revisiting, you know, like uh, 
uh, the, uh, um, uh, the lead in the swan, he revisited over and over again, and Icarus, he revisited over and over again. Um, and uh, these are not works I was familiar with of his. Of course, they're quite early. Um, and that one on the right is quite interesting. Can either of you talk about, you know, what's, uh, because it almost looks, uh, I, I can't quite make out what those lines are doing that are sticking out to the right. So how, uh, what's going on here? Plexiglass, whatever? Plexiglass in front of, Plexiglass in front of plexiglass, and these paintings are cantilevered, and the reason they're cantilevered was because he got interested in the paintings in Orvieto of, um, I think it was either Tintoretto or Signorelli, but anyway, the paintings in the churches, in the corners, all have an, an, like an additional figure in the corners. You have the painting on the ceiling and then you have the painting in the corner. So he liked that feeling of the painting hanging down. So then the first one, the Lita, he cut the canvas out, part of it out, so that it hung off and hung down in front of the, the lower painting and cast a shadow. And in the second one, there, there are two pieces of plexiglass that um, are, are casting shadows. Right, so the lines that look like they're floating in space are on the plexiglass, yeah. Yeah, yeah very mysterious looking. And, and I think one thing is, uh, he, you know, we have to say about Mike is, he, is he's very consistent. I mean, there's a, 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 a line, a through line through all of his work, you know, from this early period, we're talking about nearly a 60 year career, but there's a through line in which it evolves, but with, you know, there's a, there's a stylistic consistency um, uh, where the figures are already abstracted, big flat areas of color. Um, so uh, 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 did do you think, I mean, did he just determine that that was it? Did he think, oh, maybe I can do something else, but he kept, and why do you think he kept returning to these themes over and over and over again? He, he, uh, once he discovered that mythology would express his ideas, he stuck with mythology. He painted 13 ways of looking at a blackbird that's in the opera house, but w he, we got a, a book of, um, of Randall, is it Gerald, poems? Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens poems. That's the only poem that was visual. Most of his poems are not at all visual. Okay. So he never could, he couldn't use uh, Wallace Stevens again. And the, the, um, the thing about painting with a theme was once he p focused on mythology, he felt that that expressed his ideas um, the best in the best way. It gave him the widest range to paint in. And he changed the colors or he changed the aspect, you know, Lita and the Swan, one minute uh, the Swan is in the sky and the next paintings, Lita's in the water. That was a big discovery for him to put Lita in the water with the Swan. <laughs> so yeah, so makes it's sense. like, swan, water. oh, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, and of course, leading the swan for obvious reasons, you know, and the phallicness of the neck and so on, which obviously Mike is having fun with here. <laughs> uh, you know, that had, had, had a long time appeal. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci did a version of leading the swan that there are now copies of disappeared. Um, so, uh, uh, who's at the table? Okay, uh, Mike's in the hat. He wore a cowboy hat from he never wore a cowboy hat in Mexico, but he wore a cowboy hat in in Seattle as the whole for his whole life, practically. <laughs> different kinds of cowboy hats, you know, but uh, different styles. Most of them come from Australia. That's my mother on one side of the table. After she retired, she we lived in the same household. We were lucky that it had a built-in apartment, and so. Um, uh, we lived with her for three years, and so she came and lived with us for 20 years. <laughs> okay, that's turnabout is fair play. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, and so, uh, I, I'm, yeah, because so the cantilevers probably start to run out around then. But, I mean, this is obviously more of that same theme. Well, well he liked doing that, but there aren't very many people that uh, wanted to acquire a painting like that. <laughs> there are a few. In fact, they're still available. <laughs> if anybody's no, interested, see me after the show. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a... I'm serious. It's an awkward, <laughs> you know, it's kind of an awkward thing. Yeah, well, I mean, the other thing is, uh, you know, like any, uh, like, like any major artist, uh, the, the theme is just a, a, a launching pad. And so even though he revisits the same themes, he, you know, he keeps experimenting and trying new things. <laughs> well, I don't know how to answer that. Yes, uh, I mean, he, he would keep trying, keep that, his viewpoint was, that you select something and then you just keep working at it and working at it and working at it until you get it the way you hopefully like. Because if you don't like it, you have to keep working to get it right. And, and many people like me, I can't work that way. I would paint something and then I would try something else. <laughs> However, he never painted anything that related, he felt, to his life. You see, where I paint related to what I see, what I read, what I'm surrounded by. Okay, so uh, Spike, I want to ask you about this one because um, you know we've been uh, working on this iterative versions of the PowerPoint, and uh, I got a, I got the latest final final version this morning, uh, so that this slide could be inserted. Right. Okay, so Spike, uh, what was so important to you about this particular slide? Well, obviously, um, when, when my parents moved to Seattle in 1963, uh, they, uh, my father was represented by the Otto Siegelman Gallery. Francine Sedaris was working for the gallery and then subsequently took it over and renamed it. Uh, this image was taken of her in the gallery um, in the early 70s and yeah. she, she represented him until 2012. So, you know, 50 years worth of representation by Francine Sedaris. And um, that's, and, and, and yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And this, this building had all, this big glass window, you know, in, in the front. It didn't take her too long to realize that was too much glass, mm -hmm. and she covered it up. She had a wall uh, uh, put in it. And for a while, I know there was a space so that you could go around the wall and you could hang up something in the window, but um, it, it made the gallery much better when you had a, all walls. Um, and uh, I think Spike was saying that uh, the two of you not only went to uh, his openings, but you went to all the openings of well, which, yeah. That. They and uh, many of them were colleagues from University of Washington, obviously. Yes, but also um, that was part of being a teacher was that you, he wanted to see many shows and he wanted to um, uh, be able to communicate with his students about them. Um, Seattle was such a tiny place. There were only like maybe four galleries the Attica Gallery, the Gordon Woodside, um, there was a gallery on Mercer Island that was a frame shop. There was John Udy on University Way who was also a frame shop but represented like Mark Toby and a few people, in especially, but hmm. uh, so <laughs> Seattle, you had to support the people, the artists that lived here because as far as New York went, or Chicago, Seattle wasn't even on the map. Yeah, they didn't know it existed. <laughs> right. I, I think we're still not on their map. But right, <laughs> probably that's me. true, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, here's one which I guess isn't Greek mythology. Yeah, called Swimmers. 
Yes. Um, but it does bring up, I mean, there's sort of two issues that, you know, we keep seeing over and over again with his paintings. One is, um, and it, right from the beginning, that first painting, Origin, is that everything's very abstracted, although never completely abstract. And the second thing is, is color is uh, uh, sometimes issued completely, and then sometimes it's just a few colors. So could we you know, talk a little bit about that? First of all, um, why do you think he decided that this uh, almost abstract, but you know, figurative he style? He was trained in high school. He went to work for an advertising agency, and he did drawings for illustrating uh, boat paint and all kinds of things. So he learned to, to be very sh uh, slim and short with his drawings and illustrative, but they had to be readable right away because you can't look at an ad for long. So. Um, and he never he, learned how to paint hands or faces. No, Mike. He could draw anything. He could when he when he was in college, he could he could draw anything and anybody in great detail. But he worked so hard to dumb down because that he felt that was really important. You know that you didn't want to learn to paint hands and feet and toenails and fingernails and <laughs> nose hair. I mean, he was not interested in that. Uh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no wait. Why are we mentioning nose hairs? Did I? I don't know. No, no. Uh, it's okay. just that's no the smallest thing I can think of. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, let's go on to another one. We'll talk about so we'll oh, quickly. Um, the the inspiration for the swimmers series yes. came out of the um, nineteen seventy six Olympics. Oh, okay. When Mark Spitz was um, at the height of his career then, and um, or well, actually, we yeah, were, yeah, and he was winning all the medals, and so that was a big influence, and so there was a lot of we um, watched it. swimming we watched on it. television, yeah. and I remember watching the television then. Okay. And, and that became a big influence. And the abstraction of the lanes and the swimmers and the idea of perspective and the motion carried through with the subsequent waves that you see, um, all that was really, really influential. Yeah, and on the other hand, he is a storyteller in a way. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming that's why he never went all the way to abstraction, that he always wanted there to be a grounding in a figure or a story or a conflict or a feeling, or, you know. Right. Well, he wanted, uh, he didn't want a story, he didn't want an illustration, but he wanted the suggestion of some kind of human response. Right. So you, you, um, he loved abstract painting, and he certainly, um, he might have tried it a couple of times, but it was never successful for him. Okay, I'm interested to hear that. Yeah, I would have suspected that because sometimes they sort of get so he, close. Yeah, well, he, he, he tried to please his mother by drawing flowers, <laughs> and, and he drew flowers, but he, he was not good at it. They were, uh, they were uh, she liked them fine, but they were stylized and... Uh, it, it, it just wasn't a natural thing for him to do. Yeah, it's hard to imagine him doing a flower <laughs> well, <laughs> or a bouquet. Well, he would teach people to do it, other people to do it. Let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to another video. As far as I'm concerned, all of these myths that I use are cliches. They, they're, they've been balderdized in all forms. You see TV programs about Hercules, and he looks like some, some Olympic athlete. The idea was to kill Hercules, but they couldn't do it directly, so they were trying to give him impossible tasks. And he prevailed. These kinds of 
things that came up in his life he had to deal with is, is something that <laughs> all people can relate to. You have to live through being born, then you have to live through school, then you have to live, you know, all of these things you have to live through. What they do is they become metaphors for human behavior. If I just did one, then I'd be probably so concentrated on the content that it would affect how the thing looked. But the more I do, the less interested I become in the content. I get more interested in how the painting looks. I don't think the content's that important. I want it just to be something that's a vehicle for the way the damn painting looks. So, uh, on to Icarus. So, uh, tell us a story about uh, sort of a near-death experience for Icarus and then how it had a sort of a happy ending in terms of being relocated. Oh, I didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> I was thinking of Bruegel. When I think of Icarus, I always think of Bruegel painting where Icarus is falling into the sea. And there's two wonderful poems about it. Well, these. this was a painting that he was he was presented with possibilities for sites at the kingdom and that is the elevator shaft that is back was back where they kept the pitcher's dirt okay so that was not the most public aspect <laughs> and he 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 liked it like that so the these the interesting thing about this is that all the dark pieces that you see are uh, black painted um, metal and all the white pieces of the white figure those are the cutouts you you see okay. it's the cutout so um, in the in the kingdom it fit the space perfectly the elevator shaft and it picked up the angles that were um, from all the different levels and parts that came into the kingdom. When the kingdom was closed and blown up because it was not good enough, um, I liked it just fine, but I don't know. You never went to the I did, though. I did. I did a couple of times. But so they moved it over across from the jail. Okay, this is on 7th and... Um, it's the Goat Hill Garage, is what yeah, they call it. Yeah, the Goat Hill Garage. Well, it's across from the jail, and somebody said, well, what's that supposed to be? The prisoners falling out of their, <laughs> you know, off the side of the building. But anyway, it's, it's, it's just the, it's a tumbling figure. And that's why in the, in the kingdom, it related to as athletics. Okay. And so it was very nice of the city to move it and build a place for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That was and very nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now we get to enjoy it in, in some ways in an even more public setting. Yes, it is. Um, although it's like you have to look out your window of your car as you're driving <laughs> past, you know? So, uh, so uh, I, I think. That's Perseus um, with the head of Medusa, which is another one of these themes that mm -hmm. you know, gets, gets visited and revisited. Uh, this one has that very mysterious element of the cross uh, going up the body of uh, Perseus and hmm. uh, um, uh, dividing him in two. And also, you know, it's got this very idiosyncratic uh, use of color. Uh, you know, super monochromatic on the one side and then very polychromatic on the other. Um, uh, either of you have a comment about his attitude towards color, or if he talked about you know using color when he decided to use it, which subjects and so on? Not me. 
No. <laughs> oh, man, we need well, mics. Hey, Mike. Sorry. I mean... <laughs> uh, he, he often painted um, color across the whole uh, surface of the painting. Yeah. And you can see on the far right-hand side of this painting that there is a hint of color. There's some yellow right. uh, trickling down the edge. And that's because the whole thing was yellow. It was all the color of what the hair for Medusa was. And then only at the end did he go in and paint it flat black. And, and the reason for that is to force the perspective. And, and it, it, it pushes the head of Medusa forward into space. And um, that's, that's a tool that he used to gain perspective in his work. Okay. And I never saw a cross before. So I just I have the beholder. I have the beholder. Yeah, I still okay, so I just read it as a, as a, um, genitals and well, yeah. that's it. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> you know? And there's a lot of uh, genitalia suggestions in his paintings. Yes. Uh, Spike is shaking his head. I don't know. Uh, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm just here so I don't get fined. Uh, <laughs> don't uh, get what? Okay, either of you have any comments on this uh, Wallace Stevens uh, interpretation, 13 poems? Uh, oh, well, I can tell you that he started, he, the first one he did, he did as a term paper in college. The very first one. It was an etching, and he did um, 13 ways of looking at Blackbird. We all, he had to write a paper for a class, and um, the, uh, he must have written some some part of a paper, but he interpreted the, the poems as for an English class, and his uh, professor was Ed Racy, who actually ended up teaching here, and probably one of the reasons we came here. But um, he then revisited that same myth, you know, like the same poem. I mean, he revisited that at least, um, Mm, two or three times because he has the mural in the in the opera house, opera house on the first floor right. that's 60 feet long and that it, it, it when it was first done it was on the third floor then they moved it down to the first floor after they remodeled the opera house so um, so his his effort in um, creating the woodblock prints which is what these are these are all carved blocks of wood, uh, f special Japanese uh, plywood that is very hard and uh, holds an edge. And so that obviously is really important in his work, um, being able to control exactly where the point of the line is gonna be. Um, so his, his effort, at least in my understanding, is that he's always trying to reduce the image down to its most essential element. Um, and the woodblock being, at least in this instance, primarily black or white, uh, helps him in that process. And initially this was printed by hand um, in his studio in our basement in 1986. And then um, Sheila Coppola of Sidereal uh, reprinted them in uh, 2018 for the Epic Works uh, series of exhibitions that we mounted. Uh, yeah, uh, um, we're gonna see uh, that installation and some installation photos, you know, just before we close. Right. Uh, uh, I think most of you know, and the catalog for that is one of the catalogs that's on Save Left at the table. I think most of you know that there was a very unusual three gallery collaborative show of Mike's work as one of the very first times that many, many of his large paintings were shown at the same time, and they were thematic between the galleries of Greg Tessera, uh, uh, Woodside Brasset, and uh, wait, what's Davidson it? Galleries. And Davidson, yeah. So uh, we'll see some uh, pictures of that installation. And it's really fun, by the way, to read those poems, which are quite short, The 13 Ways of Looking at the Blackbird, uh, and 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 uh, see how Mike responded to them in these prints. You know, I, I really enjoy that. Um, I'm just looking at my time. Oh my God, I wanted to talk about this. This is a spectacular, 
boy, you think the Greek myths are, are, are sex and violence. I mean, this one makes them look uh, like kindergarten play by, by comparison. Uh, this is one I'm sure you, you learned about when you were living in Mexico, because this is an Aztec goddess. Uh, uh, but let's, let's go on to uh, uh, Her Hercules. Uh, so just a question about process here. Um, and I think, Spike, you're already referring to this. So you got to watch your dad at work. Um, and so uh, you talk a little bit about how the paintings uh, changed as he worked on them. Because I understand he didn't really start with a sketch. It was, very, it was more of an intuitive or spontaneous process. Yes, yes. Um, and he would um, work through an initial set of con uh, compositions of the images. And uh, as I say, he would often incorporate quite a bit of color in the images, and that would eventually be reduced down to almost black and white. Uh, and there's a power there in the black and white that then is transferred into these woodblock prints. And the paintings were a way for him to work through the composition uh, physically of the forms that he was depicting. Okay, so what media is 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 this, this is oil? This is this is oil paint on canvas. Okay. And this this and painting is uh, quite large. It's and about uh, seven and a half feet by ten feet. You, you have to remember that these paintings are not stretched on a on a frame first. They are nailed to the wall, and then a plywood wall. A, a plywood wall, and then he would paint, and then he he might do all red, and then he would let it dry for a, a day, and then he would cover it with black, and then he would scrape okay. the, through it, yeah. Yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. So that that's why you have this, this um, multiple textured color right. Right. layered. And there's huge, effect. thick globs of paint that are left in that process of yeah. scraping across the canvas. And also, you know, thousands of dollars of paint end up on the floor. <laughs> of the and I would ask him, I'm like, how come you just don't get it right the first time? <laughs> like, it would save us so much money. <laughs> but no, it's part of the process. Okay, this is great. This is why we're having this conversation. I love those insights. And I mean, we're talking about the scraping, and there yeah. you go. You well, know, and, and there's uh, that scraping. You can see that texture. Um, let's see, who else scraped? Um, Gerhard Richter. No. Um, Local Leon national? Golub. Leon Golub oh, had yeah. a show at Pomona College when we were there, and he had these really thick, black, gummy, gray, and white paintings, and they were all of kind of sphinxes or something. They were not scraped at all. It wasn't until many, many years later, uh, and Mike had a a student who went and worked for Golub, who s actually scraped Golub's paintings. Oh, you know, oh no! After he'd been Mike's student, he went and scraped Golub's paintings. <laughs> I don't know what happened to him. I hope he got to be a painter. But, but, <laughs> got to uh, be a scraper anyway. He got to be a scraper, yes. And uh, but they were not all scraped all over. They were only scraped in parts. Okay. You know? So. Uh, 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 so we're just going to have to look quickly. I, I find this one sexy as hell. I mean, maybe it's just me. I mean, uh, again, it's Lita and the Swan. Yes. And uh, it's, it's interesting how erotic it can be with such a symbolic or stylized language. You know? Well. I mean, more so than anything explicit. You know, it, uh -huh. I mean, there's something about the way it, you know, the way you relate to these these images, and you know, well, they're 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 simple, and they're direct, and the paint is very beautiful, and they're and, large, and they're big. Yeah, and we're gonna this just sense a scale five by five feet each panel, so that's five by fifteen feet. Um, yeah, yes. and this one is available too, by the way. <laughs> uh, 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 Spike, you were telling me that this was an homage to Jacob who was a good friend after Jacob passed? That's right. Um, Jacob Lawrence and Gwen Knight were great uh, friends of my folks and would come over to the house often. And um, I was uh, invited to photograph the two of them a number of times towards the end of their life, which was a real pr privilege. But after Jake died in uh, 
2000, uh, my father painted this version of Romulus and Remus, and it's called Black Romulus. And um, I did ask him once if, if he was the white twin and Jake was the black twin, but he never really responded with a definitive <laughs> answer on that. But I, I believe that to be true. Uh, so uh, now we're, you know, we're rocketing forward in time. I mean, you know, this is not that long ago, 2018. So this is the Epic Works show. Uh, and now, you know, you really get a sense of the scale of uh, some of these paintings. Uh, that one uh, that's in the middle background is that Mexican goddess that we were just looking at. Um, and I don't think we've seen these other ones. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's, an, uh, uh, is that another labor of Hercules on the right? I'm, I'm not sure I recognize it. That's a, a one Greek, one Trojan okay. on the right. On the right, right. Yeah. And, and the left is uh, that's Perseus a and Medusa. And of course, the reason there's, there's a horse in the middle panel, you can only see a little bit of it. And that's because of when um, Perseus killed Medusa, the blood spurted from her neck Perseus, mm -hmm. and and the um, horse Pegasus. Pegasus was born from that blood, and and so, you know. And then the third the third yeah. panel is Chimera. A chimera, and a Chimera is a a uh, goat goat creature, goat goat lion, lion. snake, and it, it and then it evolved. So was your house big enough? Because his studio was in the basement of your house, you were telling me. Was it was your house big enough that he could actually yes. put some of these large ones together, or he had to paint them separately and he didn't see them put together until they were exhibited in a place like this? Uh, well, that particular painting yeah. is yeah. 22 feet long. That's so right. So, so no way. That yeah. was not assembled in, at one time in the house. Right. Yeah, um, that's a little bit long. Yeah. But, but there was a big wall in the basement uh, that he worked on, and um, yeah. it, it could hold a 20-foot painting. Yeah. Okay. And we have room for a... 12. 12? I thought it was 15 foot. No, the, oh, it's okay. 12 feet. Okay. Gods and Giants. Um, okay, so really the next series of slides are all from uh, the Epic Work Show. This is also... A, uh, Greg Cassara. Oh, there's that, yeah, two Greek painting again. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, Bruce Gunther, who was the director of the Portland Art Museum and uh, wrote the introduction to the catalog and, you know, one of my favorite people in terms of talking about art. So he's, he's giving a yeah, gallery talk. A, yeah, he, he came up and gave talk. a talk that was, that was outstanding at the Cassara Gallery. And he's standing in front of a triptych that's a representation of the Minotaur um, and um, that was, for me personally, uh, a really terrifying uh, period of time when he was doing the Minotaurs because I was convinced that there was a Minotaur living in the basement of our house. <laughs> and, and the stairs that go down to my father's studio were <laughs> sketchy. And, and there was this one empty spot in the wall that goes into the darkness and, oh, I just have to sprint past that. And, <laughs> Just to get out of there, but um, yeah, the yeah. we we actually saw a we were in Greece on Crete, and we were we were going behind a group uh, looking at the wall murals, and we came outside, and on the sh there was a shadow on the wall, and it looked exactly like a minotaur, and then finally the man came out, and what it was, it was a man, and he had a. He had a camera in front of him, a, one of those big cameras, and it looked just like a minotaur. <laughs> so. Yeah, and we know the Greek myths aren't relevant anymore, you know, all that violence and <laughs> invasions and man in humanity, man, you know. That was then, and we're all too civilized for that oh, now. Uh, but, you know, there's this spectacular contrast, I mean, for me, between, you know, I mean, the few times I met Mike, you know, he's, you know, he's Very not... Yes. Yeah, I mean, he, if you, you you looked at the subject matter and all the he, he violence had, and conflict yeah. and anguish in his paintings, and then there's such a contrast between meeting him in person. Well, he wanted to look like George Shacona. <laughs> who's that? George Shacona. I don't know who that is. He, he was an, he's, uh, 
He's an artist. Um, he's Greek, uh, tall, had wild black hair. Um, he he looked very like a Greek, uh, like a Greek myth. Okay. You know, so um, but he didn't look that way. <laughs> he was, and he he was. I I had a picture, and I was going to fasten it to me because he was very handsome when he was young. He was a tennis player, and he. Uh, um, he, he, here is at his he, most heavy set, I would say. He's still wearing that same sweatshirt. Yes, he wouldn't let me wash it. <laughs> it says a pingo ergo sum, and I finally did wash it, and TM. it didn't change at all. <laughs> so. uh, uh, okay, so this is the same epic work series. Uh, this is Woodside Brasset. Those other ones were Greg Casera. There's that uh, Lita and the Swan. Uh, and the uh, birth of uh, Aphrodite, right? Is yes. that what's up? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, from that's, the head that's birth of Athena. Athena, Athena. 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 from the head Sorry. of Zeus, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, 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 with mostly artists, I recognize Dennis Evans. I don't recognize anybody else in the picture. With Alan Landy. Alan Landy and um, Patrice de Monby from the uh, Virginia Inn. And um, the gentleman in the hat, uh, with the glasses, I, I don't know his name. Maybe someone here knows him, or maybe he's here. <laughs> uh, but yes, there was a there was a good crowd of artists that came to support uh, his efforts in all of these exhibitions, and that's that's always very rewarding. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the one this thing is birth of Aphrodite, right? So. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'm getting my birth confused, right? This is uh, Aphrodite, uh, and that's uh, with the, uh, as in birth of Venus. Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, any concept as to what's represented by the, uh, you know, what is she breaking through the structure at the top of the painting? Oh, the structure of the, the beside her, those are legs. Okay. And arms coming down, so that's, that's, uh, she was born from the genitalia. Yeah, yeah. And the, the foam. The testicles. And the foam at the bottom. It's right. The water, the right. ocean, and so. Oh, the, okay. I get you. All right. So he's lost his testicles, and there they are at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> not, not to right. be too, not to be too specific here. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is the last painting we're going to see in close up, and. Uh, Hey, quite recent. Uh, uh, I guess it's two paintings from that uh, Trojan series, the one on, in the picture and then the one on the left. Um, actually, the, the Trojan horse painting is uh, one of the last pieces that he completed. Um, and uh, he, he tried really hard to not put swords into it and uh, conflict and fighting, but he just couldn't restrain himself. He, he had to put that in there because it's such a, it's an important aspect of what transpired because of the horse. And that was part of the story for him. Uh, the piece on the right is actually a, a Perseus and Medusa. Um, and that was from an, a different time frame, um, a photograph taken um, some years ago. Um, so uh, this one's uh, Laura Russo in, in Portland, of course, uh, dated twenty uh, twenty two. So um, how did so uh, and uh, Mike passed in February of this year? Is that correct? January twenty nine. Yeah. And so how did this show relate to? Uh, was that post? It, it this was this after he died. this okay. show opened up four days after he died. Oh gosh. Okay. Uh, and we had been working on this show for some time. Uh, and he knew exactly what was going into it and um, was excited. This, uh, this series of the labors of Hercules that you see on the um, right-hand side it was done in Dartmouth uh, in 2005 when he was uh, given an um, artisan residency there for three months. It, it, from, it where, Spike? At Dartmouth Oh, College. Dartmouth, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and he had a major exhibition there of, of paintings, large-scale works, as well as, um, but he didn't get to show this. 
He didn't. He didn't get to show this. And so this was shown at Francine Sedaris, uh in a in a different configuration. But um, now, um, yeah, we're looking for a home for this piece as well. <laughs> in fact, yeah, there's a lot of work out there. Okay, so. Uh, uh, and I hear even Jacob Lawrence complained he didn't sell enough of his own work in his lifetime. Boy, if that's even true well, of Jacob. Well, when he came here, yeah, he was almost not doing well at all. Yeah. He did much better after he got here. He got he got to do two or three installations. You know, uh, David, whatever his name was, I've forgotten, uh, um, helped make a enamel on steel. For There's one at that was in the, it was in the King Dome, and then now it's in the uh, Convention Center. Okay. Yeah, and there's one, um, but he did one, then he got to, after people saw that, then they got to choose uh, him for commissions in New York, in the subway, and, and. Much deserved. So. Um, Much deserved, it, yeah. It, it, well, the real tragedy, um, is that during the controversy in Olympia uh, where Alden Mason and my father's work was removed, Jacob Lawrence was um, being considered and actually uh, finalized as the person to do the rotunda uh, in, the, in, the, in the state capitol. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with all of the hoopla going on about the other artwork, he, he backed out. Yeah, that's as, why I was telling somebody yeah. that as we were driving here. That's so, why I thought I remembered. You know, he, he supported Alden and, and my father yeah. in that effort. And that, yeah. was, that is really, really sad. So, uh, okay, well, we've got one, just one stop left in this conversation, which is a very heartwarming uh, video. And again, I'm really enjoying these videos. So let's, we're going to go out on this, uh, on this uh, video uh, remembrance of Mike. I met Mike walking in this park in the summer of 2013, I think, and he had a dog and I had a dog and we just kind of fell into step and started talking and talked till the very end. We've been on that bench so many times. Uh, we, I, I, we've walked through this park hundreds of times, if not endlessly. In the eight some years that I knew him that we were walking around the park, we met up several times a week and over how many years would that have been? Or how many times would that have been over all those years? Thousands of times Mike and I met up in the park. I would say we were intellectual soulmates. I have a significant background in classics and Greek literature and found out early on that that is what his work was based in largely. And uh, we had a wonderful, converse, unending conversation about the intersection of art and classical mythology. He clearly had huge passions within him that he expressed in his art and clearly there was a volcano of a man inside of him um the other thing that i wanted to say to talk about was his christmas cards he took so much pride in them and they were often not actually ready by christmas but he would start handing them out somewhere toward the end of december or the beginning of january really up until april and it was such a pleasure he was so happy to hand them out and would anybody that he would talk to for just a moment, he would say, would you like a Christmas card? I absolutely adored that man. I just loved him. And I think about him all the time. And I feel his loss greatly. And it's, it's one of those rare situations where I feel as though our relationship didn't actually end because he's still influencing me. And I go to an art museum and I wish I could tell him about what I had seen. And I am grateful that I get to carry around my memories of him and still add to those memories, even though he's no longer here. Now we get a, a student perspective. Uh, my name is Dave Fotheringham, and I graduated from the University of Washington School of Art in 1986 and Michael Spafford was a professor of mine. A crit with Mike Spafford could go on for hours, and he enjoyed it. Like, he enjoyed the talk. Um, and, and that man could talk, like, a lot, and it was great. And 
and he would talk about it and look at the painting and sometimes grab a brush and do something to it um, to show what he was talking about and, and sort of also to maybe take away some preciousness that we all have as students, which is a really good thing to get rid of. Yeah, I mean, I remember Whiting Tennis telling me that he would just X out a painting um, because, you know, why not? They're not precious. It's student work, who cares? I think he was um, not an easy guy to please all the time. It wasn't like a cakewalk, but when you did please him, it was very fulfilling. In a nutshell, he taught us all, I think, that art making is work. But there's something about like just knowing that I'm going to work instead of making art that, I don't know, it's comforting. Um, and Mike gave me that. I think he's given other people that too. Thanks Mike for that. And me, I make art too, although it's illustration. Great. Okay, well that was our, our uh, the official part of our term. program. It's very difficult uh, to understand. Oh, wait, I've, I've never wait. understood. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, God. I, I didn't realize there was another minute left in that video. So, uh-oh, can we uh, fast forward or, or go through that last clip? What, what, uh, what did he say? He, uh, well, there's a, yeah, there's one last. There's one, one last, last comment on his. Mm -hmm. All right, well, somebody from Town Hall, we're gonna take a few questions, and if you could cue up the last few minutes of that video so we could just watch his closing remarks, that would be great. Yeah, okay, so um, now we will take questions. Uh, and, oh, yeah, now we're gonna get to the beginning of it. Uh oh, yeah, we don't wanna go through the whole I'm thing again, sorry. So anyway, if we could play just that last uh, few minutes, and meanwhile, we're gonna uh, take a couple questions and the Q&A come through the screen, and uh, I will read them, and then Elizabeth, you and Spike can, can take them on. Um, are you still in touch with uh, Ring Nishoka. Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Uh, no, <laughs> is the answer. Uh, Ring, Ring Nishoka was a friend of mine uh, in high school. Uh, and um, I haven't been in touch with him. He was... Uh, uh, okay, uh, well, next, well, next question. Go, next question. <laughs> yeah, next question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, w w I, I'm not seeing any on the screen. We could do it the old-fashioned way. So, somebody, it, it, somebody here uh, just wants to throw out a question, and I will repeat it uh, for the benefit of the people who are watching online, which apparently there are about 40 or 50. Did you put his items in the University of Washington uh, Special Collection to be considered? Um, okay, wait, wait, let me tell the, yeah, because the people at home won't know the question. Okay, so the question is, uh, uh, is uh, somebody from the Special Collections Department at the University of Washington wants to know if uh, there's something you would consider donating to the collection is basically <laughs> the question. This is the first request that we've had for that. But, um, yes. Yes. Uh, sure. They have we, one. Red and green painting in, on the. On, in Basically, meeting we're hall. looking we're looking at a number of organizations to step forward to accept large works um, that we can no longer house, and uh, we would be happy to work with anybody who's interested in in placing in works like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. What attracted Mike to go to Mexico, and why did Juarez, how long did he stay there? Okay, the question is, what attracted Mike to go to Mexico, and how long uh, you all stayed there? Before we were married, I went. Before we were married, I took him to Mexico because he'd never been out of the United States, and I had lived there for four years. I'd gone to high school there, so um, I, he drove down with me and a 
um, French girl and um, stayed, uh, he must have stayed a couple of months or maybe not, I don't remember. Um, but later, after graduate school, we didn't, we, we didn't know what we were gonna do, so we just got in the car and drove to Mexico and um, stayed there for three years. And he did a little teaching at Mexico City College, but he did have a studio, and he was really able to develop, to work there. Um, at Harvard, all he was able to do was, we had a one-room apartment, so he painted in the kitchen on um, uh, the cardboard that comes with mattresses, under mattresses. <laughs> And um, he did have a show at Harvard, and um, it was quite well received. And I remember his mother came from California to see it. But um, he so, liked so, Mexico. Yeah, in Mexico, um, both my mother and father were uh, exhibiting their work in the park on the weekends, right? Well, my Mike was not. Oh, okay. No. Only only my mom was doing that. <laughs> yeah, um, I was doing that. Because <laughs> she was more famous. No. Well, yes. I use my maiden name. Certainly. Yes. Certainly yeah. Well, yes. Of course she was. There's like like Frida and Diego, there's, right? There's articles in the Mexican paper in 1961 and, about and, her. He nothing did, about him. But he did get to know. Uh, Justino Fernandez, who was a famous Mexican art historian who wrote about Mike, and he met, um, uh, um, you know, quite a few artists that were um, uh, the young, much younger generation after Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. They were like Pedro Coronel, and um, there, there were, um, Francisco Izquierdo. There were artists who um, um, they worked hard, and uh, some of them had been all over uh, Europe. One Mexican artist actually drove to Florida every year to show in some kind of outdoor festival. So there was um, there were a lot more artists there than there were in Seattle. And, um, uh, it, and, it and then changed. we returned to Mexico in 1979. Yes. And spent a year there in Cuernavaca. Yeah. And that's where he was working on uh, designs for the kingdom. kingdom. Yeah. OK. Uh, anybody else? Uh, oh, well, hang on. Yes. Let me just repeat the question for the people oh, at home. Sorry. So the question has to do with, um, um, you know, obviously in Mexico, particularly Mexico City, there are these giant uh, paintings by the the uh, Mexican muralists like Diego Rivera and Siqueiros and uh, and so on. And so was Mike influenced by seeing those in terms of scale? And uh, what was his, uh, uh, you know, what were his uh, reasons for wanting to paint so large? Well, let's see. Um, I would say yes. Um, I was trying to remember if he painted big paintings of Pomona, and I don't think they were very big. I mean, they were like standard three by four feet. But later, um, he, he loved the paintings of Orozco. He didn't care at all about particularly about Diego Rivera, except that Rivera did some really interesting things like an underwater painting for the, for a, um, like a reservoir. I mean, a big underwater painting that was covered with water. <laughs> but uh, he, he really loved Orozco's paintings. 
and we, we, and we went to see Siqueiros paintings, and we went to see, Siqueiros was painting three-dimensional paintings on the outside of buildings at the University of Mexico that were, um, I mean, they were so big and so, uh, they were simple, and, but they were quite incredible because they were three-dimensional. And I can't even think of any paintings like that in the United States. Not really. No. And, and then uh, Roscoe painted like these wonderful paintings of, of a big dome. And, and uh, the Palace of Fine Arts had huge paintings on every floor that you could look at. And of course, also they were, um, some of them were about the revolution, but some of them were also about Oh, like uh, Diego Rivera did a big one about the history of science and uh, the future. Um, it, it would be quite, look quite antique now. Man at the Crossroads, yeah, it's the one that got torn down from Rockefeller Center. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so the question is, uh, what was it like for Mike when they took down the labor of Hercules at the uh, state capitol? Well, he was very depressed by the whole episode. Um, I was just furious. And, but then, you know, they, they, uh, uh, there was a, a suit, and uh, um, it was decided that the state had moved uh, illegally against him and that had not allowed him to finish the murals. And so they paid him, I don't know, 30,000 or something. And, but, um, uh, um, and, and they decided that Alden Mason's was the wrong color. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And so he, um, they kept mics up for a number of years, like 10 or 15 years. And then finally, they, when they took them down, they put them in um, um, the community, the, what is the college down Centralia. there? Centralia. Centralia College. Um, he always felt that it was some fault of his that he had not bridged the gap somehow and talked to the, the people uh, that are, were, were in the legislature. But the, one of the main problems was with the staff. Mm -hmm. And the staff saw figures in the marble. And people that see figures in the marble like to go on seeing figures in the marble. <laughs> they don't want to see anything else. And then if there were any titters from high school students, they complained. And then people in Spokane complained. And so then it got to be a big hullabaloo and you just kind of wanted to get away from it and forget about it. Uh, so, um, Town Hall is trying to uh, play us that last okay. segment of the video. And you know, worst comes to worst, we'll just have to watch uh, the rest of it again. But I would like to see that very last piece. So, uh, do I just have to, so um, can we uh, play that? Because um, I'm seeing it on my screen here. And, uh, ooh, so can I'm we, where, Oh, we're going to try to fast forward. Uh, you know, uh, 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 we're always tech, uh, technological. Uh, yeah. So, okay. What's the verdict? Do we mind Morgan watching it again? In summer of 2013, I think. Okay. And he okay. Had a dog well, this is going to be it. Then we got to we, we got to get out of here. We've run our welcome. And started talking and talked till the very end. We've been on that bench so many times. Uh, I, I, we've walked through this park hundreds of times, if not in, see, in the eight some years that I knew him that we were walking around the park, we met up several times a week. Oh, but and over how many years have that have been? Or how many times have that been over all those years? Thousands of times Mike and I met up in the park. I would say we were intellectual soulmates. I have a significant background in classics and Greek literature and found out early on that that is what his work was based in largely. And uh, we had a wonderful, converse, unending conversation about the intersection of art and classical mythology. He clearly had huge passions within him 
that he expressed in his art, and clearly there was a volcano of a man inside of him. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, say, to talk about was his Christmas cards. He took so much pride in them, and they were often not actually ready by Christmas, but he would start handing them out somewhere toward the end of December or the beginning of January, really up until April. And it was such a pleasure. He was so happy to hand them out. And would anybody that he would talk to for just a moment, he would say, would you like a Christmas card? I absolutely adored that man. I just loved him. And I think about him all the time. And I feel his loss greatly. And it's, it's one of those rare situations where I feel as though our relationship didn't actually end because he's still influencing me. And I go to an art museum and I wish I could tell him about what I had seen. And I am grateful that I get to carry around my memories of him and still add to those memories even though he's no longer here. Uh, my name is Ed Fotheringham and I graduated from the University of Washington School of Art in 1986 and Michael Spafford was a professor of mine. A crit with Mike Spafford could go on for hours and he enjoyed it, like he enjoyed the talk. Um, and, and that man could talk like a lot and it was great. And he would talk about it and look at the painting and sometimes grab a brush and do something to it um, to show what he was talking about and, and sort of also to maybe take away some preciousness that we all have as students, which is a really good thing to get rid of. Yeah, I mean, I remember Whiting Tennis telling me that he would just X out a painting um, because, you know, why not? Yeah, Whiting They're Tennis, another major it's local student. artist. Whiting Tennis. I think he was um, not an easy guy to please all the time. It wasn't like a cakewalk. But when you did please him, it was very fulfilling. In a nutshell, he taught us all, I think, that art making is work. But there's something about like just knowing that I'm going to work instead of making art that, I don't know, it's comforting. Um, and Mike gave me that. I think he's given other people that too. So thanks, Mike, for that. And me, I make art too, although it's illustration. Okay, now here's the part that we missed. Art as a term is very difficult to understand. I've, I've never understood it. Rather than uh, trying to think of myself as an artist, I. I, I try to think of myself as a painter. I'd, I'd like to be totally anonymous and leave behind a body of work that people would be just amazed to see. Uh, okay, it's a wrap. Thank you, everybody. And Thank I, you. I just want to—I I want to say one quick thing. We skipped it. Um, there was one video that did get skipped in there uh, of Lisa uh, speaking, but um, also I just wanted to say uh, Peter Vote. He—he um, uh, he was instrumental in doing those videos of Shannon and of Lisa and of um, Ed Fotheringham and helping put this all together and also cutting the film that was uh, originally captured by Paul Mailman and Michael Matisse and Lisa, produced in the basement of the house, uh, all those interviews. So thank you to all of them. And um, there's, there's a lot of people that have helped us out along the way. Um, and you know we can't name them all, but I just want to express our gratitude as a family. So thank you. OK, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Town Hall. <laughs>